Hey guys, welcome back to Predicta Restoration Tips. In this and the following segment, we're going to be talking about the most distinctive feature of these televisions, and that is the swivel CRT head unit. In this video, we're going to be talking about what's inside the picture tube. The next installment, we'll talk about the outside, how to unmount them, how to open them up, and how to clean them. But first I want to talk about the Achilles heel of this and really all vintage televisions, the picture tube. Why do I call it that? Because without it, you don't see anything. They haven't been made in decades, there's a limited supply of replacements, and there's a, there's a demand for them. No one is repairing them, no one is rebuilding them. Let's start out by talking about the unique physical characteristics of this picture tube. Philco invested a lot of time, money, effort into creating these. They called them semi-flat. While this may not look flat to you, it sure is compared to earlier generations. They call that the deflection angle. This is 110 degrees. Earlier generations were 90, 70, 54. In fact, the earliest picture tubes had such a shallow deflection angle they had to mount them vertically in a cabinet with a mirror and a lid at a 45 degree angle otherwise the cabinets would have been so deep it would have been completely impractical so these really short semi-flat picture tubes is what allowed them to put them in unique enclosures like with the swivel head now how did they do that well a combination of creating a new glass envelope but also redesigning the electron gun which led to one unique characteristic of these which is the filament voltage they run on the industry standard was 6.3 volts these run on 2.68 the 21 inch run on 2.34 they also have really short necks and really small electron guns it's not just the envelope that got that has a steep deflection angle and is shallow it's the gun itself inside the neck it's a really really short neck so why do they have the goofy filament voltage well short neck small electron gun assembly means a small space to have the filament filament is made out of resistance wire the shorter the wire the less resistance it's going to have if you put too much voltage current through it you're going to burn it out so they had to lower that filament voltage. Now that oddball filament voltage has led to some confusion about these sets. Sometimes folks don't know and they go to test the picture tube and run it on 6.3 volts and they burn out the filament potentially. Luckily filaments are fairly rugged and you can generally subject them to higher voltages for a while without them burning out so hopefully you would notice that the filament is way brighter than it should be and you kill the power before you burn it out i don't think i've ever encountered a 17 inch predictive picture tube that was dead other than one that had lost its vacuum because it was physically damaged and one that had a line burned into it because somebody kept running it after it had some issues develop but i don't think i've ever encountered anything that had an open filament 21 inch, different story, separate video, but 17 inch seem to be pretty reliable. And that's a good thing because there's a lot of them out there and they're very collectible. However, they still wear out, nothing lasts forever, so you may need, may need to replace it. So I want to talk about uh, where you can get replacements from, what you can substitute for them, and a little bit on how to test them. So ideally, sure, it'd be great to get a 17DA or DRP4 and just plop it in and away you go. They don't come up for sale very often. There are several 6.3 volt CRTs that are physically very similar. The pinouts on the base, typically a G1 and G2 may need to be reversed, but otherwise they're drop-in replacements. But you need to raise the filament voltage. Luckily, that's very easy to do because all the other tubes in the predictor run on 6.3 volts. 
there's a terminal strip inside the set that has connections to the power transformer. One terminal is 2.68, one is 6.3. All you need to do is move the wire for the picture tube from one lug to the other. If you do, I suggest you leave a note. A good place to do it is on the inside back cover of the CRT housing. So when somebody opens it up to check the picture tube, they read it on the back. Say rewired for 6.3 volt operation or rewired for and put the specific picture tube type that you put in there. So, so a technician down the line will know what the heck is going on. Okay, that takes care of the filament. What about the other voltages on the picture tube? For example, there's an electrostatic focus pin, there's a G2 pin, and then there's the high voltage. Well, those are actually all fairly standardized. Electrostatic focus, you typically connect to either ground or 400 volts or so, whichever gives you the best focus. G2 is usually around 4 or 500 volts. And a high voltage, 12 to 14,000. So there may be a 10, 20% difference in specs between all the different 17 inch CRTs out there. You really won't notice it, they'll all work fine. Now there is one physical difference you may very well have to deal with, and that is the length of the neck. The originals have a really short neck. There are one or two, maybe three, 6.3 volt versions that have a similarly short neck. There are several that are a little bit longer but will still fit in this, but there are definitely some that are longer and will protrude. You're going to need to either leave the cover off, add some spacers, 3D print a new one that has a bump on it, something like that. It will not fit inside the housing. But they'll work fine, and given the scarcity of them, it's Definitely worth doing a little bit of physical modification, and it's on the back, so it's not that visible, it's not that big a deal. Given the choice between modifying the back of this a little bit and not having a functioning TV, I'd go for the modification. I wish I knew of a magical shop you could walk into and buy a new picture tube or a website that had them in stock at all times. That's just not the case. So where do you go if you need a picture tube? Well, there are some resources, but I can't guarantee that any of them will have what you need at any given point in time. You just have to keep checking. First off, Early Television Museum in Hilliard, Ohio. On their website, they have an area where they list black and white and colored picture tubes for sale. They update their inventory periodically. Check it daily. There are other people looking for them. you got to keep up on it. Uh, surplus sales them to Nebraska. Similar deal. They sell surplus electronics. Their inventory changes all the time. Mostly they have industrial and test equipment type cathode ray tubes. They do have some television picture tubes. Check it regularly. Set up a search on eBay. It may seem like the obvious thing to do is to search for a 17-inch predicted television tube, and by all means, go ahead and do it. And if you save your search, eBay will email you every day with any matching results. However, if it's a well-advertised listing with an accurate description, it's going to draw a lot of attention. There's going to be a, a lot of bidding. It's going to sell for a lot of money. You're going to have competition. So, try something less obvious. Search for old TV tube or uh, cathode ray tube or used television parts or something like that and check it every day and wade through the listings and, and examine the photos and hope you can find what looks like a predictive picture tube. Take chances. I've certainly bought picture tubes that were untested. Most sellers don't know how to test them. They don't know what they have. You may end up with a box of broken glass. You may end up with a dud, but it's an option. Uh, certainly ask the collector's community. There are a number of Facebook groups. You can put a wanted to buy listing on the Antique Radio Forum and Video Karma. You can check Craigslist. You can check the Facebook Marketplace. And you may just want to buy a second predictive. Buy one that's really beat up. 
Hope it has a good pitcher tube you can scavenge and maybe get some other spare parts you might find handy. What about somebody making them again? After all, there are companies that still make tubes for guitar amps. 6V6s, 6L6s and such. There are in other countries. Uh, they're a little expensive but not outrageous. Pitcher tubes are a little bit different. They take more materials and more specialized equipment and more difficult to manufacture. It would cost tens of millions to set up a plant to make pitcher tubes again. It would certainly be a low volume operation. I'm sure they would cost a lot. Probably well over a thousand dollars a pop, I would guess. So that's not going to happen anytime soon, I would think. Eventually, maybe someday. I mean, the video, the vintage video game people, the vintage computer collectors, Apple IIs and such, we're all in the same boat. All the cathode ray tubes are going to die eventually. Someday, new manufacturing technologies, 3D printing, sure, maybe, maybe someday, someday in the distant future, you'll be able to push a button and make a picture tube. We're not there. Okay, what about repairing them, rebuilding them? Yeah, that used to be a thriving industry, rebuilding picture tubes. No one is left in the world that does it. You may stumble across a website like Thompson's Electronics that says they rebuild them. That's for military industrial stuff. And it's not cheap, and they don't do television picture tubes. Nobody does. The last company in the U.S. shut their doors in around 2009, 2010. That was Hawkeye. I got one picture tube rebuilt before they closed. That was about 200 bucks plus shipping there and back. Just to give you some idea what the cost was like. Now, luckily, Scotty, who ran Hawkeye, donated all of his equipment to the Early Television Foundation, and they raised funds to set up a special area. They have all the equipment. They have a room. I believe they have some electron gun assemblies. What they don't have is somebody with the skills and experience and time to run the operation. Maybe they will someday, uh, but even if they do, you can imagine it's going to be the really rare stuff that gets priority. The pre-war stuff, the early color stuff. I'm not saying they will never do them or they won't do them, but not today. And I know of several individuals who are trying to set up their own operation. There was a time when you could buy a home kit to set up a business in your garage rebuilding pitcher tubes. Those kits occasionally show up for sale. You could get one. You could read the manual, you could read up on the process, there are some YouTube videos showing how to do it. It's not trivial and it takes time, it takes you probably a full day to rebuild a picture tube. But it's a possibility, someday, not today. Now I'm not trying to be all negative and doom and gloom after all, I'm making these videos to help you restore your set, and I certainly restore them for others and for myself and enjoy the hobby, and most of the time they work fine as is, and will continue to for some time. However, the more you run them, the faster they will wear out. If you watch it a few hours a month, it will last you for a very long time, most likely. But there's always the possibility to work fine today, tomorrow you turn it on and the picture tube goes out. Just <laughs> be aware of that. There are no guarantees uh, on this hobby. Alright, let's uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about how to test a picture tube. Now, yes, they use an oddball filament voltage. However, I think pretty much every tester I've ever seen has settings specifically for the predicted pitcher tubes. The only ones I can think of that don't are the super, super dirt cheap basic testers. They don't even have a meter, they just have a light bulb uh, to showing whether it's good or not, or whether the filament has continuity or not. So let's, um, let's demonstrate using a B&K 440. It's a model I've recommended many times. The 400 and the 440 came out in the 50s. They're basic all-around testers, um, 
very easy to use, very easy to read the meter on it. Some very basic shorts and um, rejuvenation functionality, but they can generally be had inexpensively and they're very portable. So when you go to check out a set and um, the set isn't working and you want to check the picture tube, it's a good thing to bring with you. Uh, and if the owner doesn't let you check the picture tube but they're asking a lot of money, I'd be a little wary of it. But generally, I've noticed folks are, are pretty amenable, especially if you come there with cash in hand and say, hey, if this works, I'll buy it. They'll, they'll let you test it. Let's wrap up this video by actually testing a pitcher tube. So this is one I salvaged out of a debutante set that was a bit beyond restoring. There were parts missing. It had already been scavenged from... I think somebody tried to restore it and gave up and some of the parts were lost along the way. But the pitcher tube I do believe is good. So the first thing I want to do is determine what type of pitcher tube it is. Notice there's no label. Normally in a predictor there'd be a label here that would say Philco, uh, maybe SF17, 17DAP4, and uh, 2.68 filament volts, something like that. We don't see anything. However, if we look around the perimeter, there is a label up here. And it says Channel Master Corporation. Under this bar, it's a little hard to see, but 17 DAP4. Channel Master was a pitcher tube rebuilder. This is a rebuilt pitcher tube. So if we were to take the yoke off, there'd be a seam under here where they had cut off. The original glass stem and electron gun assembly removed it and installed a new one. And Channel Master was one of the larger commercial operations. It wasn't somebody doing it in the garage and they generally did a pretty good job rebuilding pitcher tubes. Now I'm going to do a separate video about how to take the head assembly apart and clean it and explain all what all this stuff is. I just want to focus on testing it right now. So to test it, once we have an idea what type it is, we need to get this off so we can get at the pins to put the test adapter on there. Be careful. Gingerly get your fingers under it and start working it off. It is an 8-pin socket and there's a keyway on it. The filament voltages are on either side of that keyway. If you don't have a pitcher tube tester, at least you can check for filament continuity. You want to check the resistance on either side of that plastic key. It should be pretty low. Under 100 ohms, I would say. Basically, if it's open, it's going to be infinite. So, if it's less than infinite, you should be able to at least get a glow out of the filament. Now I'm going to use that B&K 440 I mentioned earlier. Good, solid, basic, all-around tester. And notice, we have a heater selection here. And there is a setting for 2.34, that's for the 21-inch predictors. 2.68, 17-inch predictors. Get that on there, and we're going to leave it there. Until we know otherwise, we're going to assume that that is the correct voltage. Plug the tester in. Now this is, or the, these are the business ends. This is for color, this is for black and white. This says 12 pins, this will not fit on that. Ideally, you, your tester came with a set of adapters. And one of them should be for the CRT type. I do believe this is it. Four, five, six, seven, yeah. And that should fit on here again. Be careful, don't force anything. Alright, and then this plugs on to that. Tester is still off at this point. 2.68 volts. We're going to put this on the continuity shorts position. These are three neon bulbs here. We're going to be watching for those to glow. I want to turn off some of the lighting here so we can see that better. 
and we're going to turn this on. The power switch is the center control. It's a combination power and cutoff. We'll talk about cutoff in a moment. For now, we just want to turn it on. Let's chart the left hand side to tell you what the neon bulbs mean. Now, it can be hard to see the electron gun glowing with the yoke on there and the adapter and all that, especially if you're in a brightly lit area, but I can assure you it is glowing. And our neon bulbs are lighting up. These neon bulbs all have two sections, a left and a right half. The chart over here says if it's good, the leftmost will be completely off. G1, the left half will be lit up. G2, left half lit up. And that's where we are at. It's a good idea to let the picture tube sit for a good 10, 15, 20 minutes before checking the emissions. Especially if you know the picture tube hasn't been powered up in a very long time. Sometimes they may have been sitting around for 50, 60 years. And if you get poor readings, don't immediately assume the picture tube's bad. Let it sit and warm up for a good long while. Sometimes I'll even do it for hours if I get poor emission readings. Just to sort of wake it up. Alright, so we've got our neon bulbs indicating everything looks good. Let's do one position to the right for emissions. Excellent. We are well into the good range. That is what you want to see. Now what about cutoff? Notice it's not doing anything here. If we go one more position, we can test the cutoff. What is cutoff doing? Cutoff is varying the voltage to the control grid, G1. Just like in any vacuum tube, like a triode, the grid controls the emissions. You should be able to cut the emissions off completely by applying a negative voltage to the grid. Picture tube is no different. That grid modulates the intensity of the electron beam, which controls the intensity on the phosphor. You need to be able to have good cutoff in order to have good contrast on the picture tube. So you rotate this middle knob, and hey, the needle moves on the meter. You want to move the cutoff until the needle is on the position labeled cutoff on the meter. And then see where your knob pointer is. If it's within those two marks, it's good. So we have good cutoff. We have good emissions. This is a good picture tube. That's as much as we need to do. If there were shorts, there's a remove shorts function. The absolute last resort you would ever want to do, if you've let it sit for hours and hours, and you've got no emissions, increase the, fil the heater voltage. Go to 4 volts. Let it sit for half an hour, an hour. If you still have just crap emissions, maybe go to 5 volts, let it sit for a while. The last resort is use the dynamic intensifier, rejuvenation, they call it dynamic intensifier on this. There's low, medium, high. Start with low. Basically it will charge up a capacitor with a certain amount of voltage and it will discharge it onto the cathode. The hope being that it can wake up the cathode. Downside is it does that by removing some of the material from the cathode. There's a limited amount of material on the cathode. The more you do this, the more the material you're blowing away. And that can be a few problems. One, the material that gets blown away can now cause a short on the grid. If you do this when it's face down, that material could end up getting onto the phosphor and causing some discoloration, some dim spots. You could completely destroy the emissions. Uh, I don't recommend using it. You'd be better off not using it and maybe getting a um, a booster and elevate elevate the uh, the filament voltage a little bit rather than uh, zapping this. I know there are people that have done it. I know they've gotten great results. I never have. Or even if I have, an hour later the emissions were back to where they were or even worse. So I just don't do it. Now, if you do get emissions and they're really poor, they're maybe if they were at the edge of the bad or they're in the bad, that doesn't mean there won't be any image on the picture tube. There certainly will be. It just won't be as bright or well-defined. 
as it could be, as it should be, as a new one would. Given how scarce these are, if you just want to have a site you can power on occasionally to show your friends or whatever, use it until it's dead. Don't, don't give up on them. And even if it is dead, hang on to them in the hope that one day they can be rebuilt. Alright, I think that is going to be it for this video. I will list the compatible and not so compatible 17 inch 110 degree deflection angle pitcher tubes in the description and I'll include links to the video showing the rebuilding process and, and the various sources I, I said where you can look for pitcher tubes. Again I'll do a separate video on how to actually remove this safely from the predicted TV itself and how to get the plastic shell off of it. That's it for now. Hope you enjoyed this video on the ins and outs of 17-inch Predicta pitcher tubes. Good luck.